Thank you, Ajahn Kevli, for the opportunity to offer some reflection. And actually, I'm aware that you've all been listening to a lot of Dhamma last week, a lot of uh, Thai Dhamma and a lot of translations, sitting on hard floors and uh, not sleeping much. Probably many people really looking forward to having some time alone today. And uh, I appreciate that. I was thinking what I might be able to offer in terms of encouragement. A lot of the tone of what was talked about at Wat Nam Papong was uh, praise for the incredible standards and incredible practice of Lumpo Cha. And uh, a lot has been said about that. I thought that what I could offer as something of a supplement would be encouragement about how to practice at Wat Nana Chat now. Having been like you, someone who didn't meet Ajahn Chah and didn't train with Ajahn Chah, but who trained at Wat Nana Chat for some years, a lot of the tone which might not have been apparent of the talks from the uh, wonderful Thai elder monks wasn't so much things are really degenerating now and it's never going to be the same and in those days we were really doing the real practice. What the tone was was more like despite the fact that it was as that difficult some days not eating at all, many nights not sleeping not having medicine when you were sick etc. What these venerable elders kept saying was they didn't experience it as being that difficult because they had such tremendous faith in Ajahn Chah and they derived a great deal of energy and inspiration from his practice and he led the practice. So a lot of those comments about how much more comfortable it is now, it wasn't so much a, a admonishment, a just to kind of be aware, but there was a warning repeatedly that now that things are more comfortable that we can get attached to comfort and not practice as hard because in those days you had no choice but to practice with a great deal of discomfort. But anyway, I just thought I would, I'm sure I didn't carefully translate that, but I just thought I'd also mention that the stress that I heard was loving regard and awe for the sincerity of Ajahn Chah who just put his whole heart into the practice, was absolutely determined to realize Dhamma, whatever the hardships and the particular focus on keeping the vinya as purely in spirit and in letter as possible, as humanly possible. So that incredible sincerity. Then, so what we have here at Wat Chat is a monastery that practices a very good vinya and which trains you to understand the vinya and uh, having travelled a little bit, having spent some time in India, seeing the various standards of monastics outside of our context, this is very rare and special. So knowing the rules that Lord Buddha laid down and being able to live within those rules should be a source of uh, confidence and joy. If we can recollect it with, uh, with gratitude and joy, that understanding that most monastic traditions these days do not keep these standards, and uh, our tradition does, and that's something to derive confidence from. And then this lack of remorse, like knowing that you're not doing anything wrong, and you're living by standards that Lord Buddha felt monastics should live by. This is actually very nourishing. But we have to, uh, we have to recollect that, the, the purity, Silana Sati, recollect the purity that we live by and rejoice in it. Because I remember very well, the first couple of years of training at Wananachat, I just felt very oppressed and I felt like it was all a bit much. And um, just for perspective, now speaking, it's my 17th Pansa, I was a novice for a year and a half. So 18 years later, I remember in the first year, probably four out of seven days, I wanted to disrobe. So why didn't I disrobe? And that's what I want to share with you today. And uh, those three days out of seven, I would touch 
qualities of joy and serenity that were superior to any kind of happiness I'd experienced as a layman. So what we have to uh, bring to our training is a long-term commitment. And so I remember that it was a couple of years later that maybe it was only two days a week that I wanted to disrobe. So it wasn't the case that you have this feeling of this is definitely the right place, this is definitely the right... and that you're never going to feel like disrobing. That you have to see it in perspective and in context. When we first come to Wat Nanachar, we have to give up many things. Uh, sex, masturbation, music, calling people you want to, and you, you know, it's a lot to give up for young men. A lot of sensuality. And then, uh, so the craving that we've all made a lot of karma with swells up in the mind. And it does need to be starved. And that's a very unpleasant process. And nobody says that that's easy. And then what can happen is that your own, your mind feels oppressed by your own kilesa, at least mine did. At least that's how I see it now in hindsight. That my own frustrated kilesas was experienced by my mind as oppressive. And that's normal. And uh, this is part of uh, what the Buddha talks about, taking the green wet stick out of the water and placing it on the bank to dry. There's a drying out process. And it's not pleasant. There's a lot of patient endurance that's required. But what can happen, and what I'm pretty sure does happen at Wat Nanachat, is we can perceive the external requirements as being oppressive. The core wat, the meetings, and uh, we can start to feel like it's... Uh, the monastery that's oppressive, the core what that's oppressive, the vinya that's oppressive, but actually it's not. Because you, if you train with it, as we're supposed to, to let go, and that's what the Tatangas are for as well, to actually let go of our defilements, the experience is of a more spacious, more radiant, more happy, more peaceful mind that lives within the same core what and the same vinya. And then eventually, if the mind does become ripe and develop insight, people become completely liberated living within this core and this vineyard and they don't perceive it as oppressive at all. They just, as those great elder monks in Wat Papong were describing, they perceive it as a, a very, very beautiful and noble standard that they honor and revere. So what we need to bring to our practice then is an element of faith. And then a lot of patience and a commitment to stick to it long enough. You see it as an experiment. And this is why we try to commit to a five-year period as a minimum to really see how this bhikkhu training works. And this is another thing about what Nanachat that I thought I would mention is that it's such a sophisticated and complicated, complex place that exists in relationship to so many other things. It's actually impossible to really understand what Nanachat in one month or six months. I really think you probably need to live here for two or three years before you even know what, what Nanachat is. It uh, it's, exists in relation to so many other things. And so we have to be, we have to bring a quality of doubting our critical thoughts and doubting our doubts and be committed to a process with a long-term view. Something that I found enormously helpful within this process is uh, learning to cultivate loving kindness for myself. And this was what Ajahn Anand's suggestion to me was when I was spending my second pansa at Wat Mabjan. He suggested to me to spend the first five to ten minutes of every meditation session spreading loving kindness to myself. And originally I had a lot of resistance to that, but I could see he had a point that I had spent uh, quite some time suffering uh, with some resentful thoughts as a one pansa monk, feeling that Ajahn Jayasara at that time I wasn't particularly interested in me and didn't seem to care personally for me and so I had a lot of pain around that feeling of the Ajahn doesn't care, the Ajahn isn't interested 
And so the obvious thing about loving kindness is that uh, actually you don't need to receive metta or care from other people if you uh, learn how to offer it to yourself. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that we all have a need for metta, we all need a certain amount of nourishment. But what Ajahn Ananda's suggestion was, was to take responsibility, train myself in a discipline, and start offering that to myself. And I think it really is the case that if you can uh, generate, permeate, radiate the warmth of loving kindness within your own heart, you're not going to resent other people if they don't offer it to you. It also makes you less reactive, less defensive to criticisms from others. So when others aren't offering loving kindness towards you, offer loving kindness to yourself. And you can do your vipassana practice and you can do your mindfulness practice. There was that harsh comment, painful feeling in the heart, aware of feelings. But then you respond, may I be well, may I be happy, may I be well, may I be happy. And uh, you offer loving kindness to yourself and this becomes something very nourishing. And if you really just commit to just that much, five or ten minutes of every sit, and the other thing Arjuna Nan said, very valuable advice, was to make sure that I did do some sitting every morning, every afternoon, every evening, every day. And that's uh, enormously important if you can. There are some days where it's not possible. We have a lot of duties sometimes, but most days it is possible. And so that's the time when you generate the sati, generate the clarity, incline the mind to collectedness. But if you also offer this loving kindness, and uh, for the first five or ten minutes, over a period of years, yet again coming to this, this idea of committing to a long-term project, over a period of years that becomes something that you can do. You can offer loving kindness to yourself. And loving kindness starts with oneself as a samatha practice. And then obviously if you have the capacity to hold the kusala mindset of loving kindness within your own mind, then you have the capacity to radiate it outwards to others. And uh, this is very important. And, and obviously we train in cultivating loving kindness to uh, beings that it's easy to have metaphor first and then neutral beings and then difficult beings. But as you train in that, it gets really interesting and it's when you're having conflicts, you can actually radiate loving kindness to the people that you're having conflicts with. And then the conflict actually can become interesting. It doesn't have to be something that you react against. You don't have to go and criticize this person to, to all your friends. You can right there in the conflict radiate loving kindness. And this is a, a, like learning how to react skillfully to suffering. And this is very empowering. But it's one of those things that we need to make a committed discipline to, to uh, before it actually develops some strength. And at the very least, to respond to your own suffering with loving kindness. It's a pleasant abiding. It creates a lot of merit. And uh, it will give you some of that joy that you need to sustain the holy life. The other thing I want to talk about is just to be careful about the mind that that says it's too hard, it's too tired, it's too tired. When you come to do your daily practice, we all the early mornings and the one meal a day, the mind can feel tired. But we really need to, in a way, fight the hindrance that lies to us and says it's better to sleep. You need to sleep. Because uh, we just need to remind ourselves that in the world now, in the corporate world, and in people in private business, and people working for governments, many people working eight, nine, ten hour days. Many people very tired. And so actually even on a busy day, we do have more spare time than most lay people. And so we need to put up a bit of a fight. And so what it might mean is like sitting with the I'm tired, I want to sleep, it's too much. Blah, blah, blah. Actually, we have to sit with that. It's really important not to believe that. You have to sit past the tiredness and past the resistance to the meditation and just do it. And uh, you might find that uh, when you do rest after the meditation, your rest is more restful. If you actually let go of some of the hindrances, pacify some of the hindrances, don't believe the doubts, don't believe the aversions, generate some loving kindness and put up a bit of a struggle, 
wrestle and then if you really can commit to meditating morning, afternoon and evening you will develop some samadhi and you will develop some metta and those moments, it begins with moments, the moments of clarity and serenity which are superior to the pleasure that you used to experience when you're a layman will be a source of nourishment and if so for myself, it's only three days a week that I really wanted to be here but those moments of clarity I really trusted them. This is what I want to cultivate. This is what I trust. I don't trust my kilesas. I don't trust the pleasure of worldly life. I do trust the pleasure that comes from keeping good sila, having freedom of remorse, having faith, having a refuge, and then having mindfulness and wisdom and samadhi, which is clear and serene. So I just really want to affirm that I think you're all in a very good place. I think that the process that you've committed to is very, very noble, very, very trustworthy. And I just encourage you to try to bring patience as well as determination and a lot of loving kindness. I stress that in this talk because for me it changed the holy life. It made my life as a monk much more joyful and much more nourishing. And it's a real gift if you have loving kindness for yourself and for others. That's something that you can bring the community as well. So just encourage you to tap into the potential that you all have to generate these divine abidings and uh, care for your holy life, care for your practice, care for what Nana Chat. The only other thing I would say is to be really careful with criticisms of senior monks. Uh, it's okay not to understand things, it's okay to have preferences, it's okay not to agree with certain things, but it's important to understand that if you are critical of the people who are helping you, and uh, I know that Ajahn Kevali just works very, very hard to keep this infrastructure going, and so as in my day when I was a junior monk, I didn't agree with everything Ajahn Jayasari did, and... Uh, now I look back in hindsight and I'm feeling incredibly grateful for what Ajahn Jayasara offered. Well, he used to be able to describe Ajahn Chah's Korwat and he had a great deal of faith in Ajahn Chah's Korwat and he made it all make sense and he lifted our level of faith and I'm so grateful because that was part of what helped me to stay. And so now I look back and I recognize that Ajahn Jayasara was incredibly selfless, working very, very hard and I know why he couldn't offer care and interest to everybody because he was overworked and there was just too many people so what I wanted in terms of personal attention, nourishment, care, well everybody wanted that and the Ajahn only had so many hours and he had to get back to his kuti and he had to do his own practice and I'd, I just realized now in hindsight that, that my expectations were unreasonable and I wanted too much for him and whatever critical thoughts I had basically I don't believe them anymore and I feel a great deal of gratitude. So Ajahn Anand has stressed and Ajahn Kalyanu also stresses that to articulate critical thoughts about senior monks is an obstruction to the arising of samadhi. So it's okay to have a critical thought but in your practice of mindfulness you know a critical thought is a critical thought. And it's okay to have your preferences, but you know it as a preference. But if you're living under dependence of a monk who works very, very hard to make this situation available to you, then it's important to be reluctant to criticize, quick to praise, quick to help, quick to forgive. Well, this is the work of a monk who's training in humility that we let go of our reactions and we make the noble choices. We support the people in leadership positions. Okay, Ajahn Kevali is not an arahant, neither am I, neither is Ajahn Sakito. But 16, 17, 18, 19 years of commitment to these practices. And Ajahn Kevali can't follow his preferences. Ajahn Kevali can't get to go and live with this arahant and that arahant and go off to the jungle. Ajahn Kevali makes being committed to this monastery his practice and it's a huge offering I probably recognize that more than you because we're contemporaries we're very close in punters so I know the last couple of years my life has been more difficult more complex because I'm now an abbot and I'm building a monastery but I know that Ajahn Kevali's life is more difficult and more complex 
so I have a great deal of mudita and a great deal of sympathy. And it doesn't mean that he won't have faults, and it doesn't mean that he won't make mistakes, and it doesn't mean that there won't be difficult days for him when his speech isn't perfect. But what you have to understand is that he's working very hard to help you, and uh, has worked very hard, is working very hard, and plans to continue to work very hard. So the appropriate attitude is one of gratitude. And just recognize what I was saying before about what Nanashat being complex and sophisticated is this place, because it has such good relationships with so many other places, opens up all sorts of opportunities for you. And so you can't see that in one month or six months or one year, but precisely because you are training in this monastery with very good standards, you will have opportunities to go and train in other monasteries with great teachers. Or if you do go on, like I have, pilgrimage and had excellent opportunities to practice in holy sites, you will know your vinya and you will be able to maintain good standards while you're outside of the monastery precisely because you trained in a good monastery. This is very, very precious. So uh, it's okay to have critical thoughts, it's okay to be confused, it's okay to have preferences, but be really careful with articulating it because speech makes karma. And if you do want to... Uh, experience some samadhi. You don't want to make obstructive karma for yourself. So uh, I just rejoice in all of your practice, all of your sincere commitment, all of the renunciation. Uh, like I said, I think you're in a really good place and then I hope that you make the most of your opportunity, make that commitment, do that practice every morning, every afternoon, every evening and have that long-term commitment and you will find that as the years go by that it gets easier and more rewarding. And so these days I don't think of disrobing. So that's after 18 years, I don't think of disrobing anymore. So I hope that you will also practice until you don't think of disrobing. Ewam. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to allow some reflection. The only reason they asked me to give a talk is because I turned up before the really big adjunct. <laughs> it's nice to be here, see friends. I was just thinking, coming back to Wat Chat, which is a, a large training monastery, thinking about the training and uh, the excellent opportunity, particularly that those who live here and commit to keeping eight precepts, ten precepts, or the precepts of the bhikkhu, that opportunity and what that opportunity is and, and how the various factors of that training work. And I remember coming as a pakao, or as a layman and becoming a pakao and feeling quite baffled about how it works or would it work, does it work, lots of doubts, lots of restlessness. And now, 17, 18 years into the life, uh, reviewing and uh, seeing that in some respects it does work, depending on our spiritual, accumulated spiritual qualities from the past, and also depending on how diligent we are. We're just kind of seeing what an excellent situation, what an excellent container it is for training the mind. And so you have this uh, precepts, they're unnegotiable. When you come to a monastery, that's the standard. Everybody has to keep a very high level of sila. And so this sila is giving the mind an integrity, a foundation. It's, uh, to think in terms of a metaphor, it's like, I sometimes think of the mind being like a field or like soil. And if you uh, break the precepts, you don't take care of your sealer, it's like there's too much fire element. The sun bakes that earth and it becomes hard and cracked. And the seeds, that uh, we all have seeds, seeds of potential in our minds. And those seeds get blown away by the worldly dhammas, too much reactivity. But when we keep the sealer, it's as if that earth element is brought more into balance and uh, there's some moisture in that soil and the soil can become soft and the seeds with other elements can sprout and grow. 
And so we have this, we have this foundation of, uh, there's more lay people listening to this talk than monks and pakals, but it's the same training, sila samadhi, bhavana. This sila is, or uh, should be, unnegotiable. It, it really is incredibly important. And it's one of those things that you can only know after you've kept it very strictly for a period of time. You look back and you overview and you see what was the result of keeping the precepts and you see that the mind has an integrity. So this three root kilesas that we all struggle with, the greed, hatred and the delusion, is the keeping the sila that gives the mind some clarity and some power to be able to recognize these things and reflect on these things and in a way to begin to defend against them or protect the mind from their uh, harmful influence and start to recognize what is delusion and to start to weaken it and uproot it and hopefully to have insights into the truth. And so monasteries and those of us who have the good fortune to be able to live in them, we have this very solid and uh, very powerful foundation of sila. On top of that, we have making time to meditate structured into the, the training, into the monastic life, and this is incredibly helpful because it's that training in meditation objects, keeping meditation objects in mind that strengthens the sati. And uh, moments of samadhi in the beginning, some people have more samadhi, some people have less, but it, as Ajahn Chah trains us, it's through maintaining good mindfulness consistently that samma samadhi arises in moments and then later for periods of time and then hopefully we all develop uh, quite a bit of samadhi as we continue to train. And that samadhi giving the sati, the mindfulness, even more power and uh, giving the wise reflection more power so that we develop the capacity to reflect upon our experience. One, to recognize our experience with mindfulness and clear comprehension and then to be able to reflect around it so that Ajahn Chah is saying it's very important to keep the mind in the middle, not to fall into liking and disliking. This is based on pleasant feelings and unpleasant feelings and we need to recognize a pleasant feeling. We need to know that that's occurring and then we notice the attachment and then you need a lot of mindfulness to train, keeping the mind in the middle, practicing the middle way, which is keeping things balanced and keeping the mind in its natural normal state. So those of us who are monastics have a great opportunity with a lot of support to help that occur. And then there's other factors to this training, this, uh, the fact that we can't just meditate all day, that you have to go in arms around and you have to come to meetings and have to come and listen to talks. There's all sorts of things that you have to do that you might not do if you had the choice just to be at your kuti. And this is actually helpful, and we don't understand this in the beginning, because it's this living in a container where you do a certain amount of meditation, and you have this foundation of very good sila. And then you get to experience your mind when you're having to do things that you don't want to do. But you're experiencing it with mindfulness, hopefully. And what happens is you get to train, don't we? You all get to train with letting go. And Chah says this, so much of practice is learning how to let go. And so we get to train, don't we? You know, reactions coming up, something we don't want to do. We just surrender, we just do it. That's the form, that's the training, that's a monastic requirement. We do it. And we learn something about the peace that comes from letting go of kileza, which is different from the peace that comes from suppressing them or the peace that comes from samatha. Samatha plays an, an enormously important role. But in terms of the five spiritual powers, which the Buddha said when cultivated and in harmony, if they're all powerful, lead to the deathless. So we can't just practice samatha. You need to see your greed and you need to see your hatred. You need to see your liking and your not liking. And Ajahn Chah explains to us that the place where the suffering is, is the place where the suffering ceases. And it's this getting up and doing some meditation and then, then having to go on arms round or having to sweep leaves or having to listen to a Dhamma talk that you have enough clarity to be able to see your mind, the liking and the disliking. And Ajahn Chah also instructs us that with regards to our suffering, 
which we all have a lot of, to make big suffering into small suffering as a training and to make small suffering into no suffering. So that requires this letting go. What Ajahn Chah says is fundamentally important in our training is to recognize unwholesome dhammas and to be able to let go of them. And so if you continue in this training, you actually become capable of doing that, whereas in the beginning you might turn up and there's a lot of irritation, a lot of aversion, a lot of doubts, and then for many of us, a lot of believing our opinions that it shouldn't be the way it is and that it should be otherwise. But with this foundation of a commitment, another really wonderful aspect to the Ajahn Chah training that uh, we've trained with is that sense of a longer-term commitment that at Wat Nana Chat you become a bhikkhu with a commitment of five years. And that's uh, difficult to find in, in this day and age people who can make that kind of commitment to something which isn't short-term. But this is a extremely, it's part of the container, this making this commitment, because basically we don't understand how the very sophisticated uh, training of the Buddha and Ajahn Chah's uh, core wat, there's a lot of very sophisticated factors which work together as a package that we don't know in the beginning how it works. But it's through commitment and faith and a great deal of patient endurance that you see after a period of years you are more capable of recognizing wholesome mind states, unwholesome mind states. You're more capable of seeing your own mind, having a more of a reflective faculty and you get more skill at letting go of the things that make you suffer. So that's really wonderful. Recently, I was in India. I had the opportunity to lead a pilgrimage for the first time. There are many people involved in building monasteries. It's a a huge amount of people offer various resources to build a monastery. And so some of those people who've been helping me coming up to almost three years now of... uh, Anandagiri, Kaukau, Pechabun. And uh, some people have really given a lot to help this monastery blossom, come into being. And so some of those people asked me if I would consider leading a pilgrimage in India. And I thought that would be a good thing to do. Because for lay people, going on a pilgrimage, it's an excellent opportunity to really leave your busy and complex life behind. And going to a place like India... It's so different to, sometimes I think going to India, it's not like going to another country, it's like going to another planet. And uh, there's a real value to doing that because you, you have permission to put your ordinary life down because it's not valid, it's not relevant, it has, there's no frame of reference. You have to deal with India, which is so in your face. And, uh, and there's a real value to doing that. And so it was wonderful to be able to lead a group of Kalyanamitta, good, sincere lay people who have helped a lot. It was really nice to share some experience and help them to leave their lives. And we didn't do it, it wasn't a quick pilgrimage, it was 16 days, it was a nice pace and there was a lot of time to practice. And all of those lay people did experience deeper peace than they usually do in those various holy sites and uh, more rapture. And uh, as is often the case with pilgrimages, people come back from pilgrimage and they have more faith. And this is very important because a strong faith faculty, the next of the spiritual power is energy. We need energy to put forth effort. And so if you have strong faith, the energy is there. And then you have the energy, then you can put forth the effort. Cultivate the mindfulness, the concentration, and keep reflecting, developing the wisdom. So it's really nice to help people to have that experience and to make the merit and come back and practice a bit harder. Another thing that I found out recently is that my father has lung cancer. And so I was wondering, what should I do? Should I go and visit him? He's uh, two weeks into one month of radiation treatment now for lung cancer. And it occurred to me, I have five brothers and sisters, and it occurred to me that they're doing their bit making sure Dad gets through the appointments and whatnot. And it occurred to me that probably the best thing I could do is offer my practice. And so a few friends helped me to stay on an extra week in Sarnath and an extra three weeks in Bodhgaya. And as a new abbot, 
there's uh, a lot of things to think about and, and not just being an abbot but also building the actual place you learn a lot about buildings and uh, <laughs> you have to pay attention to all sorts of things this phenomena of having to be responsible people expecting you to be responsible and if you are responsible then you make a certain amount of barami and if you are not responsible then it's the opposite you probably make bad karma and so there's this sense of I have to be responsible I have to and so it's really nice to put that down it's really nice to have a break from that and uh, and just practice and I thought oh, that's what I'm going to do I'm going to stay here in India and I'm going to meditate a lot and I'm going to offer the merit of that. I do have strong faith in merit, and I do believe, as Buddha explains, that the merit that comes from bhavana is superior or more potent, more powerful. And so what I'm going to do for my dad is I'm going to generate bunya as much as I can and dedicate it to him repeatedly throughout the day. And so another wonderful thing about practicing in holy sites, and by the way, I think we can consider what Nompopong is a holy site, since we're all here for the Ajahn Chah gathering and there's relics of Ajahn Chah there and very special quality of uh, in the air energy it was probably the place where Tan Ajahn Chah became an Arhant it's a very special place and his relics are there as well and large numbers of monks practicing very well for a long time so the thing about practicing in holy sites is that there's extra spiritual energy and sometimes you find that you're able to do more practice than you would otherwise and so, for myself, I find it not that difficult to meditate for seven, eight, nine, sometimes even ten hours at one a day, and consistently day after day at the holy sites. And so it was wonderful. I was able to do a lot of meditation, dedicate the merit to my dad. But the point of uh, what I want to say now is coming back to the monastery and discovering that of the various couple of bathrooms are being renovated because they leaked and there's a couple of new bathrooms also and to discover that four out of six bathrooms have this interesting phenomena where the water doesn't go down the drain hole and then how that affects the mind and coming from India and you realize it's like sitting facing the wall of the Mahabodhi temple for eight or nine or ten hours a day and practicing with physical pain or cold weather or beautiful pujas one second and Indians arguing one meter behind you the next second and and just the stuff that you have to practice with there is actually fairly easy because you've got this nice wall and you just have to sit there and you don't have to relate to people and also kind of the perspective that that one has about one's good fortune when when you're in a place like Bihar so many poor people and you feel very easy to feel grateful you feel so grateful you feel so blessed when I mean, you look at these beggars who are sitting on the dirt and the dust and the rocks and looking at a drain and people spitting as they walk past and the tuk-tuks rushing past and they're just sitting in this cloud of dust and most people ignoring them but every now and then somebody giving them something and they, they just have the one set of clothes and one shawl and they sleep in that same place and you look at that and you think oh my goodness and it's easy to feel very grateful and you come back and you feel grateful and then but then this this challenging phenomena of what do you do with this phenomena of a builder who's being paid very well to make a bathroom that should, in italics, work? And four of the bathrooms, the water doesn't go down the hole. And so it's really challenging because as monks, our standard is supposed to be we're content to have the root of a tree as our dwelling. And you come from India and you realize, well, just even to have these robes and this food, we're so lucky. And there's this kind of, you have to wrestle with, should I say something, shouldn't I say something, should I be content with the puddle in the bathroom? And I, so I had to check, I'm checking the perspective with the monks and I'm checking with the land, the guy that does the gardening in the monastery and I asked him, well, what do you think? And he said, well, you know, it's the lay people's money and they want the monastery to have good bathrooms and they're paid a lot. So because they've paid for a quality product, he should deliver a quality product. So I have to kind of work up the energy to go and tell him, you have to do this again. And uh, I don't like having to say that kind of thing. But um, I did say it. But it's like, the point, the point of this uh, slight detour here is that, you know, samatha isn't going to work in that context. This is, the, this is where we need our 
capacity to reflect and our capacity to see things in perspective and context and then when one could be irritated and angry, well, not to come from that. You know, this is a, one of the things about training with a whole training. We have the vinya and then we can reflect on our emotions and oftentimes you just don't say something yet until you know how to say it or what to say. And so this is one of the wonderful things about training. It's like, you know you have to say something, but you don't have to say it right now. We'll wait a couple of days. Think about the right way to say it. This is much more difficult for lay people because life is busier and, uh, and uh, monks are life more spacious and we can take time. And so I can just tell the guy really calmly, which I did, uh, you have to redo this and the water has to go down the hole before you get the final payment. But I remember thinking, you know, it's so much easier to face the wall of the Mahabodhi temple and meditate ten hours a day. You know, after you've been meditating for a couple of decades, you develop some meditation skills, and, and it's not that... And it's in a place which has more spiritual energy, you can deal with your hindrances, you can work with a bit of pain. But this dealing with the human realm gives us an opportunity to see our mind, see our reactivity, and practice the middle way. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot to be learnt by the impingement in the human realm and of relationship. And a large part of Ajahn Chah's training as well was that he didn't let us stay in our kutis all day. He did require that we come out and clean the sala, sweep the leaves, wash our robes on a certain day at the same time. And so he required that we train in harmony and learn to live in harmony but he also required that we experience the impingement of living in community and that has a very important function because we see our greed we see our aversion and the other thing about monastic life is the routine that you get you know you basically you will know I tend to like this part of the day and I tend not to like this part of the day I tend to not like one prayer or I really don't like the day after one prayer and you and you get to see I'm likely to react about this thing on this occasion either for grasping or grasping for or grasping not for, liking and aversion. And so you get to anticipate what your likely reaction is going to be and you get to practice with it. And this is an incredible opportunity, is that living within a container where you have some sense for what you're going to have to practice with. And then this whole realm of exploring and cultivating what's called kusala upaya, wholesome means, skillful means, you're basically learning how to train your mind. But one thing which is fundamentally important for all of us is not to blame others for our suffering and not to blame the routine for our suffering and not to blame the weather for our suffering or the sound of the cars on the highway or the sound of the planes or whatever. So much of our practice is not doing that. As Ajahn Chah says, the place where the suffering is, that is the place where the suffering stops. So it's not about making the outside different. It's about seeing where the reaction is, keeping the mind in the middle, not reacting, or if there is a reaction, letting it go. And so many things in this life are important. So the Sangha Harmony is important, keeping the schedule is important, but then the meditation is important as well because that's what supports the clarity that you need to bring to training. And so uh, one thing I think we all need to do as well is take refuge in effort. And this is difficult because often we're tired. And uh, one thing I've learned building a monastery is more work, more issues, and more exhaustion. And one thing I've learned about when things get really difficult, as they have, and I don't need to go into details, but there's been a couple of periods in these three years that were really difficult, the most difficult periods of my life. And that's not an uncommon experience for new abbots. And what I learned is that when things get difficult, put forth more effort doing more good things. That's what gets you through difficult periods. The four great efforts. And, uh, and then it's like the result of the good efforts. If you just keep, keep doing good things, you take refuge in doing good, avoiding harm, purifying the mind. When things get difficult, find something wholesome to do and do it really well as best as you can. And you might find that you can get through a difficult patch and that the merit that you produce to supports you so that you keep going. And so it's so tempting, isn't it, to rush back after Bindabha and have a half an hour nap if you can. Or to get back after the meal and you know you should do John Crom, but uh, maybe you ate too much sticky rice and, and have a nap first. And so this doesn't work. Having a nap whenever we can get one actually doesn't work. 
Well, you might find that if you do your half an hour of John Grum before the nap, you know, you'll be in a much better mood in the afternoon and your meditation will go better. And we just have to do this. This is another thing monastic training forces us to do, is to work through our hindrances. So we can't sleep quite as much as we want to. We can't eat as slowly as we'd like to, all sorts of things. But And the result is you can have periods where you just feel really tired. But if you put forth an effort, even then, you end up with this capacity to go against the kilesa and the laziness and uh, end up with a powerful practice. So I'm, I'm hoping that something I've said might be helpful for training in this context. And uh, I hope it was some of it was helpful to lay people. Mostly it was aimed at the monastics. But um, thank you for the opportunity. May we all grow in Dhamma.